Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Free Marketeers podcast. Uh, we have to apologize that we weren't with you yesterday on Valentine's Day, but we hope that you all had a good day. Hopefully, we can make up with that with today's episode because I have a very special guest on today. Um, today, we are joined by Andre Dereta. Andre, thanks so much for being here. Chris, thank you very much for the invitation. Just a bit of background for the viewers and listeners who, who don't know, and uh, after today, you will know who Andre is. Um, Andre currently serves as the Group Chief Executive of ESCOM Holdings. Uh, he has a 30-year career, and over that career, he has plied his trade both locally and internationally in various portfolios in the energy space. He has significant experience in managing coal, oil, chemical, and gas businesses, including marketing of export coal to international utilities and taking responsibility for the operations of very large coal and gas conversion plants, including energy generation. So, Andre, I thought we'd start off today with what is the current state of ESCOM? How are things going in the utility? Um, what is the sort of state of play at the moment? Yeah, Chris, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, let me make a few introductory remarks. Um, as you know, ESCOM is almost 100 years old. It's uh, 98 years. And um, like any major organization reaching a milestone like that, it's an opportunity to reinvent what ESCOM is all about. Um, for most of its existence, ESCOM has been this monolithic, vertically integrated uh, utility that was uh, the supplier of essentially all electricity in uh, South Africa. Some minor exceptions, municipalities have generated uh, a bit here and there, but essentially ESCOM has been the backbone of electricity generation, transmission, and also uh, by and large of distribution. So when people think about electricity in South Africa, they think ESCOM. And I think that is going to change and change uh, quite quickly uh, because we are as um, an industry globally on the cusp of an energy revolution. And that energy revolution is driven by um, four major trends. And those trends are... Uh, Coincidentally, as these things always do, they will start with a D. Um, so the first major trend that we see is an increasing trend towards decarbonization. So as the effects of climate change become more apparent and as it becomes a generally accepted consensus that climate change is real and it's caused by human activity of which fossil fired uh, electricity generation is by no means the least. Uh, the pressure on utilities to decarbonize is becoming increasingly greater. Now, fortunately, this pressure coincides with the advent of technology that allows us to decarbonize and remove our carbon footprint from the atmosphere to a very large extent. Uh, by means of deploying um, increasingly the benefit of solar and wind generation. Now, for many years, uh, solar and wind were niche applications. They tended to be very expensive. But if you look at the declining cost curve of both of those technologies, the uh, advances that have been made in developing and uh, essentially mass producing these technologies are absolutely phenomenal. And that has resulted in a rapidly decreasing cost of producing a renewable energy in a carbon-free manner. So, for example, there was uh, a bid round recently in Israel uh, using photovoltaic um, electricity, and that came in at around about five US cents per kilowatt hour, which may not sound that cheap, but if you add in the fact that that included storage, uh, that really is a remarkable number. And what that means is that uh, we, we now have a technology that allows us to dispatch electricity when it is required. Because one of the downsides, of course, of renewable energy is that, and this is stating the very obvious, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So you have to invest in storage technologies. And of course, those storage technologies uh, are also coming down and cost quite rapidly, also driven by increasing economies of scale. 
Now, linked to um, decarbonization is the second D, which is decentralization. Now, for many years, the trend has been to build ever larger power plants. And Eskom's own Madupi and Kusile are very good examples of this. And they're among the largest coal-fired power stations in the world. And the idea behind going bigger and bigger is that you get economies of scale that you uh, otherwise lose by having a, a distributed uh, generation system, which is how it worked in the old days when, when Edison had a, had a power plant uh, every couple of city blocks or so uh, distributing DC power directly. Now, these economies of scale, however, uh, came with a significant risk, and that is the project execution risk that is attendant on every mega project. And uh, our own two projects, both Madupi and Kusile, have clearly suffered from some of those risks manifesting themselves. And this is not unique to South Africa. Uh, there are many international examples of these mega projects suffering from cost overruns, scheduled delays, and so forth. So the advent of decentralization in power generation is quite an exciting trend. And that uh, is largely due to the fact that you've got these um, solar panels and wind turbines that are essentially mini power plants that can be mass produced and they can be rolled out to wherever conditions are favorable. And you therefore have a trend where increasingly people are able to generate electricity uh, on their own rooftops. Uh, and that is a trend that I think is going to accelerate and is going to uh, continue to grow as costs uh, continue to come down. So in addition to uh, decentralization, uh, we also have this phenomenon called democratization. And democratization means that you have far more choice. Uh, it used to be that buying electricity was essentially Hobson's choice. You had to go to your uh, local distributor, whether that be um, Eskom or your local municipality, but that was it. Uh, you you had a choice. You still only have those choices. Uh, but today, you now have the option to go partially or completely off-grid. That comes at a cost. You have to make a capital investment. Um, but in the future, it is very easy to contemplate uh, a scenario where we have a different uh, generation activities going on. Uh, you may find that you may want to buy uh, from a particular generator because you like the technology, you like its greenness or it's not greenness. That, that's entirely up to you. So there's a lot more choice. And then, of course, um, as we've seen in developed markets, you find that there is a lot of emphasis on choice at distribution level. So you're able to choose who you buy your electricity from. And there are various special offers uh, available from time to time. So there's competition in the distribution marketplace. So that's a, it's a very big change from, again, the old vertically integrated monolithic type of utility that we've become used to in South Africa. And then the last D is also a very important trend, and that is digitalization. So increasingly what we find are uh, smart meters uh, that are sufficiently um, intelligent to accommodate um, various time of use tariffs to uh, manage uh, different pieces of kit in a household or in a factory to ensure that electricity consumption is optimized according to the wishes and the needs of um, the individual customer. You also have um, the opportunity to look at um, a completely digitalized market. So, for example, in uh, a market like uh, Germany, you have a real-time um, trading platform that makes a market on something like four times a minute. Uh, a market clearing price is set automatically and uh, bids are awarded and it continues like that on a real-time basis. Now, clearly, this is impossible to do if you run an old style utility uh, where you have long term contracts uh, that remain in place for a very long time. And this trend, therefore, I think is going to be.
be one of the characteristics where there's an incredibly dynamic uh, computer-driven ability to optimize and match buyers and sellers on a real-time basis. And uh, that's a trend that's already very much alive and well in the developed world. And I think we have the benefit of learning from some of those best in class technologies that uh, are now available. But we have a way to go in South Africa. We, we have uh, quite a long road to travel to get there, given the fact that we, up until very recently, still were this uh, vertically integrated uh, electricity utility company. And we are now at a point where we have to make the transition. Uh, the Department of Public Enterprises published a roadmap to the future of a uh, electricity uh, supply industry in South Africa towards the end of 2019. And that envisaged the restructuring of ESCOM into uh, three different parts, uh, generation, transmission, and distribution. And in particular, the setting up of an independent transmission entity, a so-called ITSMO, an independent transmission system and market operator, which would allow for this matchmaking between buyer and seller to be done on a basis that affords transparency, very much like the Johannesburg Stock Exchange is a platform on which you can match buyers and sellers uh, and arrive at a mutually acceptable price. Um, and of course, that foresees a much more dynamic future going forward. Uh, so that process we have started, and it's one of uh, the five priorities that we've got for our turnaround plan. Uh, let me quickly go through what those five are. So the first is to become operationally excellent. Uh, for a number of years, ESCOM has been characterized by uh, poor availability of, in particular, its generation facilities. Transmission and distribution tend to do quite well in terms of global benchmarks. And we're very proud of the performance of those two divisions from an operational perspective. Having said that, uh, they require capital investment and uh, we will need to grow, in particular, our transmission grid more as uh, the trend towards more distributed generation uh, takes place. But generation is uh, the one entity that is most closely associated with this very regrettable phenomenon that we in South Africa call load shedding. And uh, I just had a video call with a gentleman uh, in the US and he was uh, saying that in Texas, due to the cold snap that they currently experience, they have um, a variety of load shedding that they um, call load curtailment. So it's just a word with, I guess, more syllables. Um, but the effect is very much the same as that you have um, the distributed shedding of load across your grid on a rotational basis in order to avoid a nationwide blackout from which uh, the grid will take a number of weeks to recover. So that's, that's something that we need to avoid um, pretty much at all costs. We recognize that load shedding is a phenomenon that is um, the cause of hardship to the country, to the economy, to factories, to businesses, to households. And it's something that we only uh, apply as the last resort. It's not something that we uh, do lightly. It is certainly something that we, that we want to avoid. But what we've got is a fleet of power stations that are on average 39 years old. They've lived a very hard life. So if you think of a car's rev counter, we've uh, run these cars uh, pretty much with the rev counter in the red for the majority of their lives. So the energy utilization factor, which is really a measure of, of uh, how much in the red you've run, is significantly above international standards. And that has contributed to a lack of reliability of those power stations exacerbated by a lack of maintenance. And that lack of maintenance, uh, where we have not done the required midlife refurbishments, has added to a generation system where we are today that is uh, not reliable and not as predictable as we would like it to be. And of course, 
For that reason, we have launched what we call the Reliability Maintenance Recovery Program, which is intended to catch up on these um, on this backlog of maintenance programs. And this backlog uh, is, is significant. Uh, we have uh, kicked off the program in earnest uh, around about September of last year. And we have uh, stepped up our maintenance program uh, to a very significant extent. When I joined ESCOM in uh, January of last year, at the first uh, system briefing, um, we warned the South African public that we had to catch up on maintenance. If we didn't do the required maintenance, the risk of load shedding would become ever greater. And that while we conducted this catch up, uh, there was regrettably an increased risk of load shedding. So uh, while we take these units offline to conduct the much needed maintenance, unfortunately, uh, the risk of load shedding does go up. But once we've completed this uh, program of reliability maintenance, we will uh, be able to significantly reduce, but not entirely eliminate, let me stress that, the uh, risk of load shedding going forward. So the first tranche of units that we've taken offline, they will be brought back on, online um, by April of this year. And then we should already see a step change in the risk of load shedding. The following tranche will then be taken off also maintained, and uh, we anticipate that by September of this year, we should see a substantial reduction in the risk of load shedding. However, as the president has said in his State of the Nation address, there is an inherent shortfall in capacity uh, that we need to bridge. Now, we have done part of that bridging of the capacity shortfall by constructing the two mega projects, uh, actually there were three, Madupi, Kusili, and then the pumped storage scheme at Ingula. And those uh, projects have uh, come online later than planned. Uh, they were started too late uh, and they suffered from many of the ills that uh, I referred to earlier when I spoke about mega projects and the challenges of executing mega projects. And because they were done under a lot of schedule pressure, the uh, quality of the design work was not what uh, it should have been. So design errors crept in, these now have to be fixed, and that process is, is on the go. So in uh, Madupi, we have uh, put into commercial operation uh, five out of the six units. Uh, unit one should uh, come into commercial operation uh, by the second calendar quarter of this year. And we are also implementing a number of fixes uh, to the mills, the boilers, uh, in order to address some of these known design defects. Now, this is an extensive exercise. It takes a 75-day outage per plant, uh, and it also takes um, a lot of money, uh, 300 million rand per unit that we consecutively take offline. Uh, at the same time, we are completing the Kusile plant. Uh, we have brought two units into commercial operation there. Uh, unit two came into commercial operation in October of last year. And uh, by July of this year, we'll bring uh, unit three online and then the other remaining three units will uh, come after that with unit six, the very last unit coming online uh, somewhere in 2024. So we are uh, putting additional capacity on the grid, but bear in mind that as we bring this additional capacity on the grid, we also have to decommission some of these older plants. And uh, that creates a capacity shortfall, which is uh, necessary to address. So from an operational excellence perspective, we are paying attention to every element of running a reliable plant. Uh, we are looking at availability of spares. We're looking at partnerships with original equipment manufacturers. We are looking at uh, improving the quality and uh, outcome of our maintenance programs. So an enormous amount of hard work that goes into that. The second part or the second uh, top priority of our turnaround plan is our income statement. Now, 
our income statement uh, is under pressure. Uh, we uh, were able to report a very modest profit for the first half of the current financial year, but that profit is not going to be sustained. So we will again this year be reporting a substantial uh, net after-tax loss. And this is uh, something that needs to be rectified. Now, if you look at the elements of your income statement, uh, we first of all need to do something about our revenue. Now, the quantum of electricity that we sell has for a fairly long time now remained pretty flat. And that is attributable to a lack of growth in the economy. And there's a, there's a debate going on uh, whether or not this lack of growth is attributable to a lack of reliable electricity or uh, whether there's just not enough uh, of a growth driver in the economy. And I'm not an economist, so I don't want to make a pronouncement on that. Safe to say that um, revenue, of course, consists of both volume and unit margin. And based on benchmarking that we have done internationally uh, on a number of fronts, uh, it, we are absolutely convinced that the electricity price in South Africa, as charged by Eskom, and I have to emphasize this, this is not necessarily the bill that the factory owner or uh, the average householder gets on his or her account that they get from their municipality, because the municipalities do add a markup on that, which varies from justifiable to, in some instances, very high and certainly um, above the norm. So we need to have cost reflective tariffs and that has been the subject of a, a number of um, legal uh, disputes that we've had with the electricity regulator of south africa uh, we are making good progress in resolving these in an amicable fashion and uh, we will be able i believe to address the um, electricity uh, tariff issue in a way that does not cause a price shock to the economy. We, we are at idem with NOSA that what we want to avoid is a sudden large increase in the cost of electricity that causes distress to households and businesses. And that's what we want to avoid. So what we are going to do, try and do within the confines of the regulatory system is to have a phased approach to this um, but clearly, the revenue line is not uh, the only line on the income statement. We also have to look at our costs. And one of the major cost elements that we've got, obviously, is so-called primary energy, the cost of coal. So we have um, had to buy uh, substantial quantities of coal on short-term contracts. Uh, by the end of 2018, our coal stocks at many of our power stations were essentially depleted. And we had to go out into the market and buy uh, significant quantities of coal in order to replenish our depleted stockpiles. Now, this came at a cost, as, as uh, the free marketers will no doubt know. Supply and demand drives price. And because demand went up, price went up as well. Uh, this buying program has now normalized. We are now at a position where all of our stockpiles com comply with grid code requirements. So we have adequate uh, inventories of coal available at all of our power stations. And that puts us in a position where we've got far more confidence in uh, managing our coal supply contracts. Um, and we look forward to normalizing price increases of those going forward. It's also very important to buy the right type of coal, the right uh, quality of coal. And uh, in this case, we, we are paying a lot of attention now to ensuring that when we buy coal, that it's got the right quality for that particular boiler. Um, coal is not simply black stuff that burns. Uh, it has to be of the right quality to match the technical requirements, the design requirements of the uh, boiler for which it's intended. And, and hence, uh, we, we need to blend and also um, homogenize our coal to a far greater extent than I think uh, we've done in the past. So we also need to look at our fixed costs and our staff costs in particular have to come down. Uh, we've started that process. Uh, in the past year, we've said goodbye to some 2,000 uh, Eskom workers. 
And uh, this was done by natural attrition on the one hand, but also through a voluntary severance program. We uh, follow the instructions of our shareholder not to engage in forced retrenchments. So we are on a glide path to steadily reduce our headcount uh, over time uh, in order to um, maintain a, a staff cost that we believe is uh, commensurate with the requirements of our uh, very large and very complex business that we operate. Uh, there are several narratives out there around Eskom employs twice as many people as it needs. Eskom should employ 30,000 people. Uh, we believe that a uh, responsible and defensible number based on very thorough empirical analysis of the requirements of our business uh, is about uh, 38,000 employees. And we think that that is a, that is a right-sized number. We're currently sitting at about 44,000 uh, employees. So we are looking at uh, our, our fixed costs. We are looking at um, also the cost of um, our procurement. Uh, we are not particularly good at how we buy. We think that there are opportunities there for us to drive a harder bargain. And uh, this is going to be a key focus area going forward. Uh, not only how we buy, but what we buy. Um, the, this area has been a particular uh, concern in terms of fraud and corruption in the past. And uh, there are still incidents of um, untoward behavior in this space. So we, we think that there are good opportunities for us to improve the efficiency of our procurement. Um, one of the major uh, elements on our income statement is uh, the cost of servicing our debt. So our net finance cost for the past financial year was in the order of some 32 billion rand. Now that is a reflection of the third priority item which is our balance sheet. Uh, we are laboring under an unsustainable debt burden. And that is something that we need to address in a structural way. Um, the debt burden itself varies uh, depending on the exchange rate because we also have some euro and dollar denominated debt. Uh, but net debt varies between uh, around about 460 to 485 billion rand, which is a, uh, a really uh, large sum to get your arms around in order to uh, service that debt, but also to ultimately amortize that debt. And what we have found is that uh, the tenor of this debt, i.e. the period over which we have to repay the loans, um, is also biased towards the shorter term. Now, shorter term debt tends to be cheaper, but longer term uh, debt is somewhat more expensive typically, but um, is more closely matched with the lifetime of the assets uh, underlying the finance that you take out in the first instance. So we believe that there's an opportunity for us to uh, revolve this debt into a longer tenor debt uh, in order to give us a, a, a better predictability in our debt service path going forward. We are very encouraged by the signature of, um, of the so-called NEDLAC ESKIM agreement uh, between uh, government, uh, organized labor and business, which seeks to address uh, some of these very pressing issues for us. And uh, we have done uh, our calculations based on uh, ESKIM with a cost reflective tariff, uh, as well as on the uh, other hand, debt of uh, around about 250 billion rand would be a sustainable enterprise going forward. And you can see for yourself that uh, these are the two bookends of a very uh, challenging problem to resolve. But um, I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, government itself is seized with the matter uh, and it's uh, receiving a lot of attention uh, in order to, to address this challenge that we've got. So uh, other less uh, significant, but still important elements on our balance sheet, working capital, for example, we are optimizing our spares, we are selling obsolete spares, uh, we are right-sizing our inventory, we are uh, optimizing where we have common spares so that we don't have too many items of the same type 
especially where we can exchange between different facilities. So there's a there's a huge amount of work going on uh, with the, with the basics of managing our working capital. We are looking at uh, payment terms to some of our large multinational suppliers. Uh, we understand that when it comes to SMMEs, we will pay them within the 30-day commitment that uh, governments made. But when it comes to uh, large companies with a lower cost of capital than ESCOM, clearly we think there's an opportunity for us to drive a harder bargain. And uh, that process has commenced as well. I referenced earlier the restructuring that we are ongoing. We've already uh, uh, successfully divisionalized ESCOM. So we've got uh, three entities, uh, generation, transmission, and distribution. These three are managed and controlled by three divisional boards, each with its own managing director. Um, and those uh, new divisions, I believe, are operating very well. They are starting to entrench a business focus, which is very important. Uh, there is a set of financial statements underlying each of these divisions. We are finalizing the balance sheet. Uh, of each of the divisions that that remains uh, quite uh, challenging and of course that is the uh, underlying issue is how much debt each of the divisions can and should uh, carry and then ultimately what we intend to do is to have the legal separation process of our transmission business completed by the end of this year with the uh, generation and distribution businesses following in the following year. Now, why do we prioritize transmission? It is to enable us to demonstrate to private investors in generation in particular that their bids will be fairly adjudicated compared to legacy ESCOM generation. And the establishment of this ITSMO is therefore uh, an exceptionally important intervention in order to attract more private investment in the generation capacity that we need uh, from private investors. So uh, that is why we have prioritized um, our business accordingly and focused on um, the transmission business. The last element, uh, which is a, an extremely important element, revolves around building a high-performance culture in Eskom. And we think that uh, for a number of reasons, uh, after a decade of state capture, uh, after working with an entity that, that uh, inflicts load shedding on the economy, that it is understandable that uh, ESCOM employees uh, need a lift. Um, and we cannot give increases, and we haven't given increases to management for several consecutive years now, nor given bonuses so um, we can also put pay to to that uh, urban legend that that uh, ISCOM managers are indulging and in paying themselves very uh, hefty bonuses that that's definitely not the case so building that corporate culture of of, of pride resilience uh, making sure that our people are committed focused uh, is exceptionally important we have resuscitated our corporate values uh, one of our values, by the way, is integrity. You can understand that in the past, that particular value did not enjoy a lot of um, prominence in, in how the business was run. So we've got to restore a culture of integrity, good governance, but also a sense of agility uh, that our people can feel empowered to make decisions. Uh, and with that empowerment, of course, comes accountability. You can't have one without the other. Uh, and we are slowly building that culture of um, the Eskimite feeling proud of going into a shopping center after work wearing his or her Eskim blue overall uh, and not quickly taking it off and uh, uh, going into the shops without it. So we, we want to um, engender that trust and that pride in the in the ESCOM brand. And this is very important as a lever for improving our performance. As, as Peter Drucker said, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, never were truer words spoken. And therefore, 
uh, all of this activity, all of this turnaround is really premised on ensuring that our people can support uh, with their resilience, with their hard work, and with their commitment, uh, this this uh, huge undertaking that we've got of fixing a uh, organization that is barreling down the highway at 120 kilometers per hour while we are changing the configuration of the business in a very fundamental way, uh, while we are uh, decommissioning uh, plants, we are retiring plants, uh, and we are also creating a new future for the business. And talking about a new future, and these will be my last few comments before I conclude, uh, we are seized with the importance of making sure that as we transition away from coal, that that energy transition is a just one. Uh, we have in South Africa a number of communities, a number of businesses that have invested uh, generations in the coal value chain. And for us to uh, shut that down and move away from it overnight uh, will simply not be equitable to those communities. So it is very important to make sure that as we transition away to lower carbon forms of electricity, that we can create a future. Uh, for those communities and in particular also for the workers that, that work not only for us, but for the mines, for the contractors and so on. And uh, we are very encouraged by the interest that, have been, that, that has been shown by uh, developmental financing institutions in exactly facilitating this just energy transition. Uh, we are in talks with the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition around uh, potentially creating special economic zones to facilitate uh, investments in building renewable components so that we can enhance uh, local content, local entrepreneurial activity. Uh, we need to uh, repurpose our existing uh, plants, uh, so equip them with either gas or renewable energy, uh, also equip them with storage. This is as couple of benefits. You avoid rehabilitation costs, but you also leverage your existing transmission infrastructure. And this is really an exciting part of our strategy, very much core to what we are doing at ESCOM to create a, a new vibrant uh, utility that will play a smaller, but still a crucial and important role in the economy of South Africa going forward. So with that, Chris, I'm going to, uh, to pause. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks to everybody for listening. And I'm going to hand over to you to uh, interrogate me now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andre. I think that was a, a very useful and good deep dive to where things currently are. It's come how things stand and maybe your ideas and plans going forward. So we've got a lot of questions coming in. We'll try to get to most of those as we can. Um, in the meantime, I had a few questions and talking points that I wanted to get your view on. So just from the free market perspective, and I won't pretend to speak on behalf of all libertarians and free marketers, then I'm going to get in trouble as well. <laughs> but from the free market perspective, you know, we think that increased competition will allow innovation, improve quality and keep costs in check. So what are your views on competition and the energy sector? And then just some ideas or thoughts on changing the law to allow anybody who meets the technical specs to produce and sell electricity, for example, allowing mining companies to gen generate their own electricity and selling that electricity to the, to the surrounding communities, maybe the same thing with the sugar industry. Mm. So we, we have uh, made it very clear that, that the entire purpose of our um, restructuring effort is to enable and attract more private sector investment in the generation sector. So by so doing, I think we, we are putting our money where our mouth is in terms of um, encouraging competition in the generation sector. Uh, we, we think that there is um, a significant amount of uh, capital out there, um, investment appetite, certainly from uh, discussing with some of the banks, but also some of the companies interested in investing. There, there is a lot of appetite to come in and invest at a time when South Africa has a shortfall in generation capacity. So, so we very much welcome that. And uh, we uh, are very encouraged by the steps that the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy have taken in order to 
facilitate and accelerate the um, various uh, determinations to allow more of these projects to be built. So uh, from a generation perspective, we are, we are very much in favor of it. The transmission part of our business is uh, somewhat more complex, um, and that is due to the fact that it is categorized by economists as um, a so-called natural monopoly, which means that it doesn't make sense to build uh, a plethora of different transmission lines doing the same things. That just uh, is, is not economically sensible, just like it wouldn't make sense to have five or six different railway companies each building its own railway line to uh, Durban, that, that doesn't make sense. So there are certain infrastructure type of investments that, that lend themselves to being state owned. Um, we don't think that it's appropriate that such an important strategic asset as our transmission grid should be owned by anyone else than the state. Uh, and we also don't believe that it would be efficient or economically desirable for us to um, try and create an artificial market in transmission. Various companies, uh, various countries have tried different models of this, um, but generally speaking, even where there are multiple transmission companies, there is incredibly stringent regulation to prevent any abuse. Uh, returns are very closely monitored and checked. And uh, it is, it is uh, a sector where we believe for South Africa not being part of an integrated power pool like you've got in the US and also in Europe, uh, it makes most sense for us to, to keep that uh, within the current confines of, of the ESCOM business. Uh, distribution again, uh, ultimately we believe that the future will be that there will be competition in distribution and that the focus will be on quality of service, uh, cost of service, and we are preparing ourselves in order to be able to compete with uh, various value-added offerings uh, in order to ensure that we are positioned to be competitive. But we fully anticipate that there will be competition uh, in that space going forward. And uh, that, I think, will, will allow the sector also to, to flourish. Uh, so, in principle, uh, we are not opposed to uh, competition in, in the electricity supply industry. We, we think that it will encourage uh, efficiency, it will uh, drive down costs over time, uh, but it will be important to ensure that those costs ultimately can be passed on to the end consumer and not be captured in uh, a margin that is disproportionate to the risk taken by the investor. Thanks, Chris. In that same vein, I wanted to ask you a bit about solar generation and just sort of a solar capacity in people's individual homes. So there have been recent moves to strict solar purchases in South Africa, but surely this sort of thing, you know, will, will make ESCOM's job more difficult. Not to say that if 10 people have solar panels, it's going to solve all your problems, but maybe if you, are, if, you know, everyone was allowed to have their solar panels and not to quote unquote, rely on the grid, that would make things a bit easier for you? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a narrative out there that somehow ISCOM is, is opposed to uh, domestic rooftop solar generation. That's, that's not the case at all. Uh, in fact, uh, we welcome the president's announcement in SONA that a government will look within the next three months to lifting the cap on so-called embedded or self-generation uh, without a license, subject, of course, to technical grid access requirements uh, from one megawatt to 50 megawatt. We think, in principle, that's a good thing. It will, uh, we hope, unlock additional investment in generation capacity, uh, and it will uh, certainly go some way to bridging the generation shortfall that we've got. In a country like Vietnam, they were able to add 7.2 gigawatts of additional capacity to the grid in a very short space of time by, by lifting a very similar restriction that they've got. It is, however, important to understand that when you put your solar panels on your rooftop, that uh, in order to go completely off grid, you would have to invest in uh, very large batteries and a, a very large array of solar panels. And this comes at a cost. So virtually all the solar panel installations that you see for 
uh, domestic purposes are grid linked. With other words, they uh, rely on own generation when the sun shines, but when the battery is depleted and the sun doesn't shine, then they tap into the grid. What that means for Eskom, however, is that we have to keep available uh, a very large infrastructure, power stations, transmission lines, distribution infrastructure, and so forth. We have to pay people. We have to maintain our stockpiles uh, for giving that uh, consumer the, the luxury of being able to tap into the grid uh, and save on the expense of not having to buy an outsized battery installation. So what we are advocating, and we think that we, we uh, are doing the right thing, is to split our tariff into an energy charge. So you pay for the energy used, but also for a capacity charge. So if you want to use Eskom as your virtual battery, then unfortunately we are going to have to charge you for that because it costs us to have that available for you to tap into uh, whenever you need. And that really is uh, the purpose of this change in tariff. It's not aimed at um, in any way inhibiting the installation of solar panels. Uh, we welcome it. We think it's a good thing. Uh, but we do need to have a tariff dispensation that supports the, the various risks uh, that are apportioned across the value chain and that there is no free riding taking place by people uh, who don't want to invest for very good reasons in, uh, in those large battery arrays. Um, we think that the future of um, large industrial or mining customers putting up their own solar plants, uh, that future is here. Uh, we, we are um, in discussion with some customers already to wheel some of that capacity uh, over our grid. Uh, it's not always so easy. We, we are uh, breaking new ground here, but uh, in principle, this is something that we think is 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 positive. It's good. Uh, we are able to then amortize uh, the costs associated with our transmission grid. Again, we offer a service. It's like a toll road on which you you transport your freight from one point to another. There's a cost associated with it. That cost needs to be recovered, uh, and. Um, Again, we, we think that uh, this, this notion of more distributed generation is, is a positive one uh, that will help to address the shortfall in generation capacity. Thanks, Andre. I wanted to get your thoughts on the independent transmission and systems market operator, or ITSMO, um, and your understanding of when or whether it will be introduced. So, uh, Chris, that will uh, be implemented subject to a significant number of regulatory approvals uh, that have to be obtained uh, by the end of the current year. So by December of this year, that's the target date that we've got for legal separation of our transmission business. But bear in mind that because we are a regulated business, we are dependent on various regulatory approvals um, for example, in order to register a new company, we have to get permission from the Department of Public Enterprises, from National Treasury. Uh, we have to obtain permission for issuing a new license to the new legal entity from NERSA, uh, from the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. So if all the actors in uh, this particular uh, uh, ballet play their role and they and they give us those approvals as quickly as, as is required, then we we should have um, the ITSMO in place um, within the next year. And that, again, I think is going to be a, a pivotal moment for the electricity supply industry in in demonstrating that that we now have this, this independent adjudication of bits, a very, very important step forward. In the past, there have been concerns around, and this is going to be a loaded question, so, you know, <laughs> full transparency, but around ESCOM's relationship, not, you know, it might be a false narrative, but around ESCOM's relationship with the government and the state and sort of political interference. So I guess any any light you can shed on that, whether it's an issue or non-issue, uh, maybe the relationship between ESCOM and Treasury, any of those sorts of dynamics at play? No, I'm not too concerned about political interference uh, in terms of 
receiving a diktat from any minister to do X, Y, and Z. Um, of course, we we uh, follow the prescripts of our shareholder. That that is just how any business works. Uh, of course, the minister is is grumpy with us when there's load shedding, uh, but I think so are 59 million other South Africans. So. Uh, the narrative that there's undue or excessive political interference in ESCOM certainly is not something that I've experienced. Uh, we believe in having data-driven debates with our shareholder. We, we engage in um, discussions, sometimes um, quite uh, heated discussions to, to, to make various points. Um, but at the end of the day, the numbers speak, and then we arrive at a, at a, at a rational conclusion. So I'm not um, being in the, in the seat I'm in. Uh, I don't think there's, there's truth to this notion of um, excessive political interference. You mentioned Vietnam, sort of one example of where certain other sort of tools and policies have been used. I wanted to ask whether any countries stand out to you in some sort of electricity reforms that they've made in the last 10, 20 years that you think, you know, it's easy to say, you know, South Africa's peer countries, all the policies that they have done will work here. So we have to keep in mind the South African context. But are there any other country policies that you think could be sort of uh, quote unquote uh, plugged into South Africa and work here? Yeah, so we, we look at um, a number of uh, different models. Uh, Northwest Europe is a very good model for us. Uh, the major difference, of course, is that they have a number of interconnectors between uh, the, the grids, but we have certainly seen a huge uptake uh, in private sector investment in generation capacity there. Um, again, uh, catalyzed by the creation of an ITSMO or uh, some other creature very similar in, in uh, nature, if not in name, and that, I think, is, is, is a key model for us going uh, forward. Uh, similarly, uh, the United States, uh, China, uh, they have uh, deregulated and restructured their electricity supply industry. And uh, we think that there are therefore a number of examples uh, across the developed and developing world that we can glean from in order to learn. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we are in regular discussions with uh, some of our counterparts in utilities uh, in China, in, in uh, Italy, um, in France, uh, in Germany, um, in order to learn from what they've gone through in terms of uh, going down this road so that we don't have to make the same mistakes by learning. Uh, we, we also obviously can uh, avoid some of the issues that they've confronted. If you look at um, the, the very negative impact of uh, a very hasty move away from coal in the UK, for example, particularly in the north of England, where there are a number of communities that have essentially been left destitute after the coal mining pits closed. And uh, that is something that we want to avoid and hence our emphasis on the just energy transition. So uh, we learn we engage and we and we copy uh, where it is appropriate. But the one thing that I think is is quite clear is that uh, we are, as we currently structured, one of the uh, last remaining vertically integrated uh, monopoly utilities in the world. Uh, we are an anomaly and we we have to catch up and we have to change in keeping with uh, those those mega trends, those four Ds that I referred to earlier. I had a question around, um, this is linked to the previous one that I asked you, the second to last one, um, around the role of the government. Is there anything sort of overnight, I know it's it's nice to think about sort of someone clicking their fingers and something changing overnight, but are there any changes that the government could introduce that would empower ESCOM and by extension South African citizens that would make your job easier? I think the um, announcement made by the president and SONA is one such initiative. Um, looking at the role that uh, freeing up uh, embedded or self-generation or distributed generation, how that could assist us in uh, unlocking additional capacity quickly by leveraging private capital. I think that that is probably one of the uh, easier 
decisions, hopefully, that, that uh, government can take. It is still subject to review by DMRE, uh, but I do think that the data support, um, particularly based on a study conducted by uh, Chris Yellen and uh, Meridian Economics, in this regard, that, that indicated that as much as 5,000 megawatts could be added to the grid uh, in a relatively short time period by lifting this uh, licensing restriction. So uh, I think that's an example. Uh, and then I think also um, the, the uh, support of continued reform in the uh, electricity supply industry uh, is, is very important uh, and enabling uh, us to make this transition in a uh, structured but accelerated manner that enables us to grow the economy in a way where electricity supply is not a constraint but an enabler. I have two more questions for you and then we'll turn to the comments section where we have reams of questions so we'll take the highlights from those. This is a, a two-parter from my side. What are your three priorities to achieve by December 2021? And then secondly, if you had a magic wand, well, how, how would you wave it and solve your biggest problems tomorrow morning? Right. So the three priorities that, that I've got aren't necessarily um, the three priorities that will be in place by the end of this year. I think that's, that's, a, that's a bit too aspirational. But I would certainly like to see uh, an end to load shedding. I, I think that that is something that uh, everybody who is remotely connected to electricity, whether as a producer or a consumer, uh, should aspire to. So that that is definitely uh, top of the list. Uh, secondly, I would uh, like to see a situation where ESKIM can be financially self-sustaining. So that implies that we have to migrate to cost-reflective tariffs. Uh, it implies that we have to restructure ourselves in terms of our cost base uh, and that we successfully implement our turnaround program. And then uh, thirdly, uh, I would like uh, ESKIM and by extension South Africa to be uh, the poster child for a just energy transition. And if those are my three top deliverables that I'm, I'm able to tick off, then I would be delighted. Um, the magic wand question, uh, if I can do anything to uh, fix my problems tomorrow, is uh, the reliability and availability of our generation plant. If, if, if I could ma wave my magic wand and fix that, um, life would be a lot simpler. I'm glad we've now got those key performance indicators. So we should, uh, we should all pin them against the wall and <laughs> remind you of those. The final question from my side. Uh, it's just around investment in South Africa. I know it's a broad question, but you know, from our side, we view expropriation without compensation as probably the biggest threat to South Africa's continued, well, hopeful prosperity, never mind recovery in future years. So that's a big concern for us. But along with that, you have the question of unreliable electricity supply that contributes also to less investment, you know, fixed capital investment. From your perspective, how does South Africa allay those concerns? I think we're going to allay the concern around an electricity supply constraint by using what we've got as a uh, as a crisis and turn that into an opportunity and that is why if we can have an appropriate suite of policies uh, industrial policy energy policy uh, fiscal policy that allows us to attract new private investment into both the manufacturing of components for predominantly renewable energy, but also invest in the generation space. We can accelerate the resolution of our uh, electricity generation shortfall while attracting uh, new investment into the country and with new investment, create new jobs. So if we are able to, to pivot from uh, this, this negative downward spiral uh, into a virtuous cycle, uh, an, an upward spiral, then I think we will have turned crisis into an opportunity. And I, and I believe, based on my interactions with various um, investors, uh, but also with a number of government departments, that, that this is within our grasp. 
Right. We had a two-part question from Chris Yelland in the comments. And it's a technical one, so I can break it up into two. Um, but the first part is, has ESCOM stopped all work on the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor and its successor, uh, the so-called Advanced High Temperature Reactor, since the departure of Molefe and Coco? And then the second part, does ESCOM have any plans to build, own, and or operate Generation 3 and Generation 4 pressurized water reactor nuclear power plants beyond Kuburg? But as I say, we can go back to part two. Right. Um, thanks, uh, Chris and Chris. Um, yes, we, we have stopped all development work on PBMR uh, some time ago already. Uh, so all that we're doing is care and maintenance. Uh, it is a relatively modest amount that we spend um, every year. If memory serves, it's around 12 million rand a year. So it's, it's um, in the bigger scheme of things, it's, um, it's not a huge quantum. However, having said that, it is still uh, something that we would wish to sell. Uh, Eskom has no desire to keep that particular IP in its portfolio. We, we believe that the chances of successfully commercializing uh, PBMR are quite remote. And we are therefore engaged in discussions to transfer that to Nexa. Um, at this point in time, uh, Chris, to the second part of your question, what is our stance on nuclear? Just to um, cut down to the chase, which, which I think uh, underlies your question. Uh, we are, of course, the only operator of a civilian electricity generating nuclear reactor in South Africa in uh, Kuburg. Uh, we want to extend the life of Kuburg. It's a, it's a very competitive plant. It's a, it's a plant that's been well maintained, well looked after, and can certainly uh, be extended in terms of its life by another 20 years uh, without creating any sort of uh, safety hazard well within international norms. Um, if a new nuclear plant were to be contemplated, and I have to stress I'm speaking in the subjunctive mood now, uh, if that were to happen, then by law, ESCOM is the only entity in South Africa that can operate a civilian uh, nuclear reactor. So we would be the default um, uh, operator of, of such a facility. But ESCOM itself is not actively pursuing the construction of such a project. We will be wrapping up in the next few minutes, so make sure to get those questions in if you want me to put those to Andre. Andre, the next one, has ESCOM considered auctioning the coal contracts more efficiently to ensure taxpayers are getting more value? Yeah, that's a, that's a great free market question, I guess. Um, the challenge that we've got with, with our coal mines is that um, our power stations require a consistent diet of coal that has a very predictable envelope of qualities. Uh, what we've seen is that where you have um, a number of different uh, coal suppliers feeding in coal to a particular power station, that power station is a lot less reliable than a power station which is linked to a single mine. And that difference is quite substantial. It's about a 16% difference over time in uh, our EAF. And what that means is that because coal is not homogenous, it is, uh, coal is, a, is an organic substance that varies widely in quality, uh, that you can't simply um, use the lowest cost coal um, and feed it into your boiler. The, the, the more consistent uh, the supply of coal is in terms of quality, the better the outcome in terms of electricity generation. So the, the um, contracts typically that, that we want to enter into are longer term contracts. Um, coal on conveyor belt, take as much coal as possible, first of all, off the road. Uh, secondly, off rail. Rail is competitive, but still not as effective as conveyor. And once we've got uh, as much coal as we can get on conveyor, then we believe that um, partnering with um, capable and strong uh, coal mining companies is the way to go in order to ensure uh, the lowest cost uh, and highest quality uh, supply of coal into our power stations. 
We have a question regarding uh, debt and the non-paying municipalities. So from Stuart Pennington, what about non non-paying municipalities and what are your plans to recover the debt from them? Yeah, uh, Stuart, that's a that's a great question. Uh, the non-paying municipalities, of course, are a major problem. Uh, collectively, they now owe us about uh, 36 billion rand uh, in arrear debt. Uh, the top 10 municipalities owe us about 70% um, of that. The top 20 municipalities owe us about 85% of that. So the problem is not that widespread, but still it is a problem of huge magnitude. Now, we have tried many levers to persuade municipalities to pay. We have uh, applied the so-called nominated maximum demand. We have attached bank accounts, vehicles, uh, other movable assets. Um, but the model that we uh, think is uh, going to work best is something that we are currently trialing with, with Maluti Apufong, um, which is uh, close to Harry Smith in the free state where we uh, are implementing something that we call active partnering. So in essence, ESCOM steps in, acts as the agent uh, for the municipality, uh, maintains the um, infrastructure, substations, distribution network, and so forth, uh, assists with billing, installs prepaid meters, but also very importantly, collects revenue on behalf of the municipality and that revenue is then collected and paid into an Eskom bank account. And with that payment of the revenue into the Eskom bank account, we can ensure that the current account is serviced on a uh, regular basis. And uh, if you prevent the further buildup of incremental uh, municipal debt, of course, then that's, that's a very good start uh, towards addressing the debt problem. There is still a substantial rump of legacy debt that will then have to be addressed. We, we are in discussions with a number of uh, government departments uh, in an attempt to address that. I'm not at liberty to elaborate on that right now, but we certainly think that uh, this, this active partnering concept is a far more constructive and appropriate way of engaging with our uh, customers, the municipalities, and ensure that we get paid and that service delivery in those municipalities, which in some respects um, are, are failing in their obligations to their residents in terms of consistent and available electricity supply, that those issues can be addressed by ESCOM stepping in and taking over uh, as an active partner. On to the next question. How high priority would you rate procurement effectiveness as a business risk in ESCOM? And how can this be addressed? Obviously, Chris, when we procure, we do so within the confines, first of all, of Section 217 of the Constitution, uh, the uh, Public Finance Management Act, uh, the, the triple PFA and various regulations um, that, that are attached to that. So, so we, we operate within a regulatory ecosystem uh, that that is uh, different to what one would see in uh, the private sector. Uh, we do believe that we can drive a um, harder bargain with our suppliers. We believe that we can be um, that we can use our buying power when it comes to something like accepting escalation, for example. Um, our Total annual procurement spend is about 140 billion rand per annum, a huge number. And by that huge number, we also play a significant role in creating inflationary expectations into the economy. And by uh, actively um, negotiating and bargaining hard against uh, inflation-linked increases and making sure that if there is an increase, that it's well-motivated and that it is well supported by uh, data, by benchmarks, um, then we feel that, that we can also play a role in, in uh, lowering inflation in the country overall. Uh, so, so we are going to keep on focusing on ensuring that uh, we are as commercial as we can be in terms of our procurement practices in order to drive costs down uh, because 
we want to also be responsible for our own cost base and be as efficient as possible. Our final question, and we'll, we'll wrap up on this note, um, from Ntando. Are there any plans to allow competition in serving the end user and potentially removing or creating competition for municipalities? Ntando, um, I think ultimately, um, if you look down the road, that's probably where we're going to go. Um, if you look at um, your, your average British newspaper, for example, you will see uh, advertisements from different um, distribution companies and the one promises you um, X discount if you use electricity between this and that hour and this one gives you uh, a certain limit, very much like um, cell phone companies competing with each other uh, in order to entice and attract as many um, customers as possible. However, we are quite a long way away from that in South Africa, particularly because of the fact that uh, municipalities in particular derive uh, quite substantial revenue from electricity sales to their residents. And if one were to move away from that, then you would need to find other ways of generating uh, that revenue or for those costs to disappear, which of course is, is, is very challenging. So while that might be the end state that is um, foreseen and that is aspired to, uh, I think for South Africa, uh, competition at a distribution level is still quite some way in the offing. Thank you, Andre. I think uh, that's a good note on which to, to end. So I will thank you very much for your time and all your, your insights today. You're very welcome. Thanks for the opportunity, Chris. Viewers and listeners, as always, thank you so much uh, for your support and your interest today. Thank you for all the comments and for watching along with us. Just a reminder that you can watch this episode uh, after it, it sort of ends. It will be on the FMF's YouTube channel, as all our podcasts are. A reminder that you can also get the audio version of our podcasts on various audio platforms, such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. We are the free marketeers on those channels. Um, to keep, keep in mind that you can find all of our work on www.freemarketfoundation.com, all of the different policy and opinion work that we do there. You can find our articles and press releases, and please uh, remember to read them and share them. As a final note, remember to like and share this video, share it on your different social media platforms. And a last call to action, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the FMF YouTube channel for more content like this in the next few weeks and months. But for now, we will say take care out there, stay safe, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye. Yep.